And we also want to welcome those of you that are here for the very first time. Uh, welcome to New Hope. And those of you that are streaming in by internet, we want to say welcome as you join us in our new series called 20. 20. We're going to take out, your, if you take out your notes, we're going to talk about what time is it. As we talk about our heart, let me talk a little bit about the timing of God. And it's a very timely message today as well. But let me begin with a story of what uh, took place. I've never missed a flight. I mean, I, I've... I've gotten delayed and flights have been canceled on me, but I don't miss flights. And I, I've traveled a great deal ever since I was in my 20s. And that's, that's not 1920, but in my 20s, uh, I, I've flown all over speaking at camps or different conventions or conferences. And so I'm used to traveling a lot, but I've never missed a flight. But this one was my first time. I was going to a place in Florida to speak. So I boarded the plane in Los Angeles at that time had a layover in Denver, and I got in an early flight about 7 o'clock. The next flight that would be taking me to Florida was at 10, three-hour layover. And so I thought, this is great because I really have a lot of study to do and some emails to catch up on. So I, was, I found a quiet corner, and I was pounding away on my keyboard, 7 and 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and I thought, okay, I better start wrapping this baby up, close the computer, start moseying down to my gate. Yes, I still had an hour, but as I got to my gate, I noticed it was bare. There was nobody there. It was a ghost town, except for one East Indian guy that was typing on something. You know how they move their head like this? And, and, uh, and so I said, whoa, what's going on? I said, uh, this place is empty. And then I looked up on the board, and it said this, flight, whatever the number it was, boarding close, departed. I said, what's going on? I'm supposed to be on that flight. It's gone already. I don't mind if you guys leave a little early, but at least you could have called. He said, he looked up at me and he said, what is your name? Oh. I said, it's Wayne Cadero. He said, oh, I remember we called your name and you didn't respond. I said, wait a minute, this is my flight. I've got an hour left. He looked at me and he paused as if to smile a little and he says, do you know what time it is? I said, what? Do you know what time it is? I said, yeah, yeah it's 9 o'clock. He said, oh, we have found the problem. <laughs> you see, what I didn't realize is that when you go from L.A. to Denver, you have to turn your clock up one hour. And I shouldn't have been working on email. I should have looked and seen what time it was. I had to wait another three hours before the next flight to Florida. And as I'm flying, this one phrase kept ringing in my head. Do you know what time it is? <laughs> <laughs> and that whole day, and I'm there to speak at a conference and these, these words, do you know what time it is? And this, and this whole week. And then it sort of morphed from an East Indian accent over and it's like it morphed into God's voice. And it was like God was saying, Wayne, do you know what time it is? I mean, do you know what time it is now of how I'm working in your life? What I'm emphasizing. You see, what I realize is this, is that God has a clock on his wall. Now, we have a clock too, but often we don't jibe with God's clock. And there's a clock uh, uh, for your life, what God is emphasizing in your life right now, lady. What God is late, uh, working on in your life, brother, might be a marriage or it might be a relationship or it might be a, an attitude or it might be a, a tendency to just get depressed or victimize yourself. And God is saying, do you know what time it is? Do you know what I'm working on right now so that you can cooperate? Or are you going by a different time, a different watch? Because if you do, you're going to miss the flight. And you see, God... God's clock doesn't have sweeping hands. He helps us to recognize what time it is by signs and events. There's a setback, an illness. And sometimes we get upset and say, God, why? What's going on? Whenever there's a setback, whether it's a financial setback or a health setback, the first question isn't why. First question should be this. Listen, what are you saying to me, God? A relationship breaks up. God, what are you saying to me? Because you see, you need to match up with God's clock, not mine. 
And that's where we learn to, to stay in step with God. That our timing gets to be with God's timing. So that you stay current with what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Otherwise, we're, we're going by a different clock. And God is wanting to work with us. He's emphasizing something. Maybe when there's a setback, God is saying, maybe it's time that I'm going to be work. It's time to work on your humility. Because you've gotten kind of you know, tantaran lately. So we're going to just bring a, a new season of humility. Or we're going to work on the fact that you've become someone that wants others to serve you. We're going to restore a heart to serve others. Maybe we're going to work on some relational issues that have been broken. A marriage or your relationship with your children or children with parents. Maybe it's, a, it's time that God is going to do a change in your life. Break a habit or an addiction. Or maybe a wrong judgment that you've put on somebody by hearing something they said or misheard something they said and then you put a judgment on them. Well, that's, that's him. Okay, that's it then. That person is a whatever, liar or cheater or this or that. That's it. And even though it's a misperception, you've held on to that judgment and it's, it's held that person hostage in your mind for a year or two now or longer. And God is saying, do you know what time it is? Do you know what I'm working on right now? And if we're not walking in step with God, we will miss that flight. Timing. God's timing. You all know how, how it sounds when there's wrong timing, when the timing's off on a car or timing's off on, you know, uh, amateur musicians, like, ugh, timing. You can have bad timing. If, you, if you've got bad timing on certain things, it just doesn't work. Even here in Honolulu, if you're going to cross the street, you better have good timing, right? <laughs> if you've got bad timing, you're going to have radiator marks right about here. What, what, what is a, a music? When you got music playing or a band playing with bad timing, what do you call that? Country Western music. You got a. No, I'm just kidding. I listen to country music. I'm just joking. Speaking of joking, you got to hear this story. There's a, two guys that are friends working in the bank. And I mean, there's 12 or 15 others working in the bank, but these two buddies, they're working in the bank and together. And, all of a sudden, there's a brash of robbers that break in. Their faces are masked with black cloth, and they're brandishing automatic weapons. And he says, up against the wall, says one of the robbers. So all the employees jump up against the wall in single file. So they just all line up against the wall. And instead of going to steal money from the cash registers or from the safe, they start going to the employees. Give me your wallet. Give me your jewelry. Give me your watch. And then they go to the next one. Give me your wallet. Give me your watch. Give me your jewelry. And, and these two guys are at the end going, oh, man, what's going on? And they start coming towards him. And uh, just then, one of the buddies hands his friend something. Without looking down, his friend says, what is this? He said, that's $100 I've owed you for some time now. <laughs> Good timing makes a difference. <laughs> You got bad timing and you got good timing. But this message today is very simple. I have one question for you. Do you know what time it is? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what God's working on in your life? Maybe through a co-worker's displeasure with you and you think, oh, first thing, whoa, God, what are you saying? Maybe God might be saying you're putting a little bit too much of your identity on what they think of you. And now I'm displacing that and replacing it on what I think of you. That's what you need to look at. You see, God is saying, do you know what time it is? Do you know what I'm working on? Are you going by the world's clock? You're going by yours? You're going to miss the flight. The Pharisees and the Sadducees come up to Jesus and they ask him kind of the same thing. It's in Matthew 16 and it's going to come up on the board. Let's read it together. Would you please go? The Pharisees and the Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now you've got to hear something about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are polar opposites, like oil and water. They did not like each other. 
The Pharisees were strict, stoic, legalistic people. They took the law of God, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if you miss one little thing on that law, they will just condemn you. They are so legalistic. They believed in heaven and hell, but most are going to hell if you don't do what this says. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were liberal. They didn't believe in heaven or hell. They just felt that this life was the all that you had and God existed to help you make this life the best ever. Well, of course, you see that they couldn't get together, but they did. The Pharisees and Sadducees came together and you think, what? There's polar opposites. It, it's, it's like saying the vegetarians and the meat eaters had dinner together at the Hilton. No, it doesn't happen. Well, the Democrats and Republicans agree on who the best president will be for the next election. No, it doesn't happen. It, just, it won't ever happen like that. But they, the only thing they had in common was their common hatred for Jesus. Pharisees with their stoic, stern, legalistic front. And the Sadducees don't believe in heaven or hell. This is, this is it right here. Now, if you don't believe in heaven or hell, that, that gives you a life without hope because you have no hope. And that's why they were called sad, you sees. Okay, so I'm running low on jokes. And they come to Jesus and say, show us a sign. Now, they had seen a draft of signs. They've seen miracle after miracle. Water turned into wine. The lame healed. Lepers healed. The dead rise. They had seen all kinds of miracles, but they came asking for another sign. Show us one more. <laughs> one of the scriptures, another book says, and Jesus whew, sighed a deep sigh. What that means is, is like he's almost exasperated that, that they would ask. That. You've seen so many signs and you want another sign. And I thought, you know, I wonder if we're kind of like them sometimes. I mean, God's blessed us so much. He's given us, given us life. And instead of thanking him for what he gives to us, we're mad because what he hasn't given us. Give us another blessing. Bless us some more. But, 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 but do you know how much I've already blessed you? Uh, yeah, but give us one more blessing. Come on. Yeah, but I've given you like hundreds and hundreds. One more blessing, as if that would satisfy us. But then it will want one more, and then another. It's not a matter of what we have. It's a matter of the heart. And that's exactly what Jesus was dealing with with these people. But we can be like that. I mean, think of how much God has already blessed us. We're alive, aren't we? We're here. It will take all of eternity for us to have time adequate for us to say to the Lord how grateful we are for all that he's given. For example, getting up this morning was not guaranteed to you. God didn't have to get you up this morning, but he did. And most of you got up pretty late, but uh, he, he got you up. Gave you another breath to take. We're here. We can comprehend and God's given us so much. And yet we say, B -b -b but I want more. <laughs> and God is saying, no. Be thankful for what you have. I've given you so many blessings. So many. Be thankful for that. And the Pharisees said, well, we just want more signs. And so Jesus then responds. And would you read this as it comes up? Read it with me. Go. But he replied to them. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? God is saying, I want you to discern the signs of the times. Don't just want another blessing. I've given you so much. Be thankful for what I have. And sometimes we look at these things, we just want another blessing, and God is saying, well, wait a minute. Are you grateful for what I've given to you? I was thinking, you know, God has blessed us so much, almost as if he's saying, 
be grateful for what I've given to you. Because like Ron Bright, who just passed away, he, we don't know when God's going to call somebody's number up. We have no idea. He could call your number up tomorrow, mine tonight. We don't know. In fact, the book of Psalms says it this way, our times are in your hands, which means God decides how much time you have here on the earth, not us. Yeah, but, 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 no, no, wait a minute. You have to remember Jesus was taken to heaven when he was 33 years old. And his mother Mary could have said, why? Instead, he brought redemption to the world. It's like God says, you did what I asked you to do. It is finished. I'm going to pull your ticket. God determines that, not us. But sometimes we're not grateful for that. But we, we get to be. We get to be. And in fact, what God might be saying is when someone goes home to be, the, be with the Lord, we pause and say, you know, what God is saying to us is this. We get to be really grateful for, for those that are around us right now. Our gratefulness needs to increase because we don't know when God's going to pull our number. And so we get to be very, very grateful. Just, in fact, Lanu's brother Robert, uh, you know, John and Lanu Tilton here, he j just went to be with the Lord by an undeserving accident last week and uh, God took him home. And uh, he was a shining light to his family and to the people that he worked with over at United. And uh, just wonderful, wonderful man. And sometimes we, like when I got to my gate, what's going on? Where is it? What is it? And the guy says, do you know what time it is? You know, I, well, here's what. When you, when you hit something and there's a, a jostling or a setback, instead of saying, what is going on? Here's our first question that we should ask. God, what are you saying to us? What are you saying? In other words, what's your time clock say? What are you emphasizing? What are you dealing with? Because sometimes we fight against the symptoms when God is saying, if you do that, you miss the substance of what I'm trying to say to you. And sometimes when, when God does something, we need to just stop and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? It's a finan financial setback. What are you saying? There's a... Fracture in the family. What, is, what are you saying? You know what God might be saying? I want you to get brave now and start the healing in your family. Well, it's his fault or her fault. My boss's fault. No, it doesn't start with them. It starts with you. And if you're not careful, you'll miss the flight because you're blaming everybody else instead of asking, what are you saying, God? And so when we see that people are taken away, we have to remember, first of all, that God determines the times and the seasons, not us. And God might be saying, when, when my dad was taken away, I was, uh, my mom rather was taken away, I was really mad at God. I was in high school when that happened. I shook my fist at God, I remember. I was mad at him. But later on, I realized my mom was about 51 when she passed away. And it's like the Lord said, you know, instead of being mad at me for having pulled her ticket, I want you to learn to be grateful for 51 years of a gift. 51 years I gave you a gift that you didn't deserve. 51 years as a mom, as, a, as someone who counseled you, as, as someone who was a friend, a sister, an auntie, I gave her to you. And I began to understand that what I was losing was a heart of gratefulness. And through this, God, what are you saying? One of the things I'm saying is I want to restore to you an understanding of what it means to be a man of gratefulness and my heart restored, and my relationship with God restored. Everything changed. Do you know what time it is? Do you know what I'm saying, what I'm doing? Pharisees, they had no idea. God is saying, now listen, I want you to understand what's happening. There's signs. You can read the signs of the day. It's like you have an app on your iPhone. You can tell what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, he said to the Pharisees and Sadducees. You can look at your iPhone and tell me what the, the easterly winds are going to be. But you can't discern the signs of the times. You see, one of the things God does on his clock is he gives us signs, not hands that move, but signs around us. And he's saying, discern the signs of the time that'll tell you sort of like where you are in my scheme of things. In fact, you say, well, what are the, some of the signs of the times? Let me share with you that 
One of the signs of the times is when there becomes a downturn in the morals of the church and the country. It's a sign. Something's happening. And another is physical signs of famines or of earthquakes, great earthquakes. In fact, let's read the scripture as it comes up of what's taking place in Luke 21. He says, this will be a sign in the, that these are the last days. Read it with me, go. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be what kind of earthquakes? Continue. And in various places, plagues and famines. Stop for a second. Did you know that last week they found the beginnings of a bubonic plague in Yosemite Park. One person contracted that. And they caught that. Thank goodness that health department stopped that. But do you understand how close we are to a plague running amok? And, and that's right in our own backyard. Continue. Go. When these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads. Because your redemption is drawing near. So he says, when these things, what? Begin to take place. Not when they're in full bloom. When they just begin to take place. Straighten up. <laughs> and lift up your heads. Get it out of the world's time clock. And look to God's time clock. Because your redemption, that word redemption is a word for ransom. Your ransom, your freedom is close. I'll talk to you about that in a second. But he's saying... One of the signs of the times, so you'll know where in the chronology of God we are, you look around, you'll see that there's going to be an increase of earthquakes and, and floods, etc. Now, there's, there's always been earthquakes, but you will see that them at an ever-increasing rate of getting closer and closer together, and great earthquakes. Now, this won't be obvious to many, but I'll tell you in the last... Uh, listen, I don't know about you, but I know... We're in the last chapter. I don't know where in the last chapter we are, but we're in the last chapter. And one of the signs of that is an increasing of earthquakes. You say, well, what are you talking about? Let me just give you sort of the last, not 20 years, not 50 years, but in the last nine years or so. Watch this. Let me share with you some of the things that have taken place just in the last nine years or so. We all remember December 26, 2004, an earthquake moved Sumatra 100 feet. And when that happened, listen, 290,000 people died. 290,000, not 20,000, not 29,000, 290,000. Move ahead two years, Pakistan, earthquake, 86,000 people died. Move the clock, God's clock. Two years ahead, May 12, 2008, Western China. 80,000 people die. Move it two more years ahead, Haiti. 360,000 people just died. And then March 11, 2011, Tohoku, Japan. 18,000 more people died. Do you know in the last nine years, over half a million people have perished just in earthquakes? And I haven't even told you yet about New Zealand and Christchurch, that earthquake, or over in Chile or in Turkey. You see, you say, I, I didn't know, some of you say, I didn't know about the Pakistan one or the Western China one or how many died or the magnitude of that. You know, it's happening so quickly now, we don't even have enough time to sufficiently mourn for one before another nails us. Pretty soon, you know what happens? We just sort of get jaded. Like, what were we ever really? You know, there's 360,000 died. Hmm? It's happening at such a rate that we don't even realize. And now there's nuclear threats and then there's ISIS. And another interesting thing is, did you know that the economy's downturn is accelerating to such a rate that we have no idea what's going on? Do you know how America is doing okay now? You see construction. You know what's propping us up? Our loans from other countries. America owes in our debt. We owe $16.7 trillion in debt. You know how much we pay just in interest alone every day? Every day we write a check. Every day we write a check 
for $1.2 billion in interest payments only. Just interest. Because the amount of money that we have from other nations that we have borrowed. China alone, every day, we write China a check for $73 million, just interest. Every day. So if you're Pake, rejoice. <laughs> we are paying interest payments, $51 million an hour. $51 million an hour. Because you think about it, $1.2 billion a day, not a month, not a year, a day. What economy can survive when that continues? Now, we did borrow $2.8 trillion from one source, and we don't have to pay interest on that. You know why? Because the government has borrowed $2.8 trillion from your Social Security accounts. Now, you continue that, and how long will we survive? We're being propped up on loans. Do you understand the signs that are going on? And it's like, if we're not careful, we'll miss the, the flight. So, of all of this, what is God saying? I'm going to give you a fact, and I'm going to give you an application. Are you ready? Here's the first. The fact is, number one, we have to all recognize that we are in the last days. So we have to think like last days people. We have to live like last days saints. There's a sense of urgency. But we have to recognize that we're all in the last days. We're that close to the end. Now, some people say, ah, all you preachers talk about last days stuff. That's just crazy. No, no, no. Just look at the signs. Don't look at me. Look at the signs. What time is it? It's like God, with all the signs, you can hear God say, do you know what time it is? <laughs> no, we're not in the last days. Well, sure we are. Not only are we in the last days, biblically speaking, we're in the last days, biologically speaking. What do you mean? Well, watch this. Raise your hand. Those of you, oh, those of you that are 40 years old or over right now, go, raise your hand. Now look around. You're in your last days. <laughs> If you're 60, you're pow. <laughs> the front row people here, now you just gave away your age. If you're 50 and over, you've got 20, 30 years left. See, see understand, we're, we're, we've only got so much time left. It's not like, oh, we've got another 100 years, 80 years. No, no, it's not that much time. Biologically speaking, we're coming to a limited time. So we have to think differently. If you don't, these last days things won't be obvious to many. You'll miss, it. You'll miss the signs and you'll miss the flight. I've sat with many people who are in their last days. And just to give you an example, and as a pastor, I, I'm with a lot of people that die. Uh, not that I caused it, you know, in any way, but, but they're in, in their last days, maybe their last moments, maybe their last two or three breaths. But here's something that I've found out. I have found out that when I'm sitting with someone that's in their last months or last days, they never think and they never say, man, I could have made that one more real estate deal. Or I could have made a hundred bucks more when I sold that car. Or why doesn't that person pay me back that hundred bucks that he owes me? No, all of that's like, forget it. You know what they're thinking about? How do I get my heart right with God? And how do I make my relationships right with people? That's it. And we can learn from these people. There's so many signs that say we're in the last days. So we have to think differently. Think differently because God gives us signs. And every sign means something. That we're in the last days. Like if you go down the street and there's a big red octagonal sign that says stop, what does that mean? Yeah, to some it just means slow up a little bit. <laughs> and if there's a sign that says slow, what does that mean? Slow, or to some, doesn't mean a thing at all. <laughs> but these signs have meaning. I remember the story of these two Christians there holding the sign, and it, it said, the end is near, turn around, follow Jesus. 
And one car comes around, rolls down his window, and yells at him, you bunch of fanatics, get out of the road! And speeds off, squeals his tire, he goes around the corner, and they hear this splash into the river. And one Christian looks at the other and says, you know, we should have just made it simple by saying, bridge out ahead. <laughs> So when you see a sign that says, the end is near, turn around and follow Jesus, there's a reason. <laughs> but it won't be obvious to many. In fact, there'll be some that'll even mock. Let's read what the scripture says here. Go. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of... Yeah, it's the same. Listen, don't wait until you splash into the river before you realize I should have heeded the signs to think differently. So it won't be obvious. Scripture says that. Let's read this in Matthew 24. You read it with me? Go. The coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Yeah, don't wait until you're in the river. Before you say, hmm, God, what are you saying? <laughs> See, it's like God is saying, do you know what time it is right now? Well, you don't know about this circumstance and what I'm going through on this and what I'm going... Do you know what time it is and do you know what I'm saying to you? What must you do? Some changes, habits, maybe your trust displaced incorrectly, leaning on something like we are in our country on other people's money to prop us up. And God is saying, you know what? I'm going to start taking that away. Do you know one of the ways God judges a country is he allows them to have bad leaders. So the people start to suffer. And if you look all the way through the Bible, you know what God is saying? When there's b bad leaders that come in or, or enemies that come in, when they cry out to God, you know what God's answer is? Then turn back to me. It's the way God judges a nation that's turned away from him. He allows things like these signs to come in. And when we cry out to God, here's his answer. Then turn your hearts back to me. Because God, like he does anything to get our hearts back so that he can bless and help. And the children of Israel wandering off. Their hearts are wandering off. So he's Babylonians. Like, uh, just nail them, would you? The Babylonians come, beat the snot out of them. And then they cry to God. God says, turn back to me, says the Lord. No. Okay, Assyrians, go. They beat the snot out of them. They cry out to God. God says, now turn back to me and I'll help you. No. Just take the Assyrians away. Well, if I take the Assyrians away, but you don't turn back to me, it's not going to do anything because you'll keep drifting. I don't care. Okay, Philistines, do your thing. They beat the snot out of them and they cry out to God. God says, turn back to me. No. Okay, is there anybody else I can use? Portuguese people. Why well, you come? <laughs> Portugal, go. He's like looking for anybody to beat the snot out of them. Why? So they'll turn their hearts back to God. And what was their reply? No. Reminds me of that little kid standing on the pew. Then the mother says, sit down. Church is about to start. No, I'm going to stand up. Sit down. Church is starting. No, I'm going to stand up. She said, I said, sit down, grabs his ear and yanks him down and sits him down and says, I told you to sit down. And the little kid looks up at his mother and says, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. <laughs> you see, we have that rebellious streak. And so God allows those things to come in. Why? To turn us back to him. And if you don't know what time it is, and if you don't know what God is saying, you'll miss the flight. And we'll be fighting symptoms. Whenever you hit a wall, first thing to say is this, not what's going on, God. 
but Lord, what are you saying to me? How shall I live? Are you working on something in me? A displaced faith, a displaced trust, a habit that needs to be broken, a judgment that needs to be rescinded, an anger, a, a, a misperception, maybe a humility. But God, what are you saying? And when you start to walk in time with God, there's a cadence and you're starting to stay current with the Holy Spirit and there's an insight that's developed and a, and a perception. So you say, all right, so what's the action then? If the, the fact is we're in the end times, what's the action? The action is just like when someone is dying, what are they thinking about? The same thing we need to right now. All that's going on, here it is. Would you write down somewhere? What is God saying? God is saying in general, here it is. Get your heart right. Get all your accounts clean. Because God's not going to do anything in your life with unclean accounts, broken promises, unresolved conflicts. Remember, it's not sin that destroys God's people. It's unresolved sin that lies within us. And the two directions to get our lives together is get your heart right first with God. Get it right with God, vertical. And then get it right with one another, horizontal. Get it first right with God. Please listen, if you haven't received Christ yet, I want to give you an opportunity today to do that. At the end of the service, to come to Christ. Don't just kind of wonder if maybe I think I'm a Christian. No. Well, I've been kind of hanging around church, so like just under assumption I assume that I'm good enough. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with your goodness and has nothing to do with how many times you go to church. You need to drive a stake and say, this day I opened my heart and received Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior. I've chosen to turn from my sins and turn to God. If you've never received Christ, I want you to get your heart right with God. And today's the day. Today's the day. And the second is, to get it right with people. And that's what the greatest commandment of all is, isn't it? That thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and all your strength. And the second is like unto the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And people of the last days understand the importance of that. Are there people that you need to forgive, rescind that wrong judgment? to just choose to lay aside that need to take revenge or to wait on someone's acceptance. You've been waiting on a person. Remember, they zap your strength. Only he who waits on the Lord shall renew their strength. You've been waiting on people for their acceptance, their pat on the back for you to be able to feel good about yourself. Maybe God is saying you need to get all of that right with people. Do you know that I think the meanest counseling sessions I've ever had are not with non-Christians, is with Christians. When? Well, I'll tell you when. When there's an inheritance to be gained. <laughs> I mean, Christians turn into terrorists. They're like ISIS people. Crazy. And so relationships are destroyed among Christians. And I'm thinking, I wonder if God allows there to be a setback and, and not take you to the end of your life, but take you to the end of your rope. And where you say, you know, it's not worth it to exchange money for a relationship between another brother or sister. And so God may be speaking to us to get our relationships right. Did you know that I know a lot of Christians that have, have eternal life, but they don't have an abundant life. They have eternal life, but they don't live an abundant life. Now, there's a bunch of those. Really? Oh, absolutely. Did you know that you can be a pill and still get to heaven? You can be a dork head and still get to heaven? Yeah, because your entry fee to heaven is paid not by your performance or your attitude or your ability to relate to people. Your entrance fee to heaven was paid by not your performance, but Jesus' performance. Not your sacrifice and blood, but his blood. You understand that? So by putting your faith in Christ, he pays your entry fee. But you can still refuse the abundant life and have broken relationships. 
I mean, you'll still get to heaven. <laughs> Angels won't like it. You know, someone's coming to heaven like, oh, here's John. Come in, come in, come in. Get in. Get out of here. Oh, shit. Okay, next. <laughs> yeah, you can get into heaven because it's based on Christ's performance, not yours. But John 10.10 10 says, I have come that you might, might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Don't settle for anything less than an abundant life. And so we get things right. At the end of the conversation with the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Lord is talking to them and they push back on Jesus. And they say, give us a sign. And this is what Jesus says at the end. An evil and an adulterous nation seeketh after a sign, but no sign will be given them except the sign of Jonah. In another portion of Scripture, it expands and unpacks that. Just like Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. And then he left them. What was he saying? You want another sign? Here's your last sign, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You miss that, you miss the flight. Doesn't matter how many blessings you get. You miss the flight. And he left them. Get that together first. So let me bring it all together and say this. If you've not received Christ, but you're coming for more blessings, more answers, more this or more that, stop for a second. And the Lord is saying, you missed the death and resurrection of Christ. You missed the flight. Do you know what time it is? If you don't know Christ, the time is now to receive Christ. Make him your Lord and Savior. And if you're a Christian, get your heart right, not only with God, but with others. And when there's a setback and something that you're struggling with, make sure that your first question is, God, what are you saying? And when you hear what he's saying, You'll be known as a person of insight and perception. And you'll learn to walk in cadence with the Holy Spirit. Now you're on your way to an abundant life.